this first one. <clears throat> What's the kinetic energy of 1.56 kilograms? Well, that's the mass. Object moving at 94 kilometers per hour. And we're looking for the kinetic energy. Okay, the temptation is to just take this formula. And just plug the numbers into it. What's wrong with that? These are not fundamental units. And they're not, they won't give you the answer in joules if you put it in like this. Kilograms is, yes, kilograms is fine. That goes in mass. But the velocity is not right. So what units does the velocity need to be? What's the fundamental unit for length? Meter. Fundamental unit for time? Second. So velocity is meters per second. So this needs to be converted to meters per second. Right? So <clears throat> when you've got two different units, that need to be converted, do one of them at a time. So let's take kilometers first. Kilometers on the bottom to cancel out, meters on the top, thousand meters in a kilometer, right? Meters is done. Now let's do hours. Hours is on the bottom here, so it has to be on the top there. How many seconds in an hour? 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour, 60 times 60 is 3,600 seconds in an hour. You can do both of them if you want. I mean, you can, you can chain them together, it still works. I just didn't have enough room. Okay, now velocity is what? Well, let's see. This is a don't want to forget your calculator on exam day. 36 when you divided into it. Okay, I get 26.1. That's that. Let's keep four of them. Why do I do that? To avoid rounding error. At the end, we'll chop it down to three significant figures. So if the velocity is that, then kinetic energy is one half mass, 94, oops, excuse me, 1.56 kilograms. And then we have to determine this one. Oh, we already did. Meters per second. 26.11 meters per second squared. Do not forget the square it. Okay. <clears throat> so I've already got that one in my calculator. I'm just going to square it. And then times 1.56 and then divided by two. So I get 531.796. What are the units of measure here? Well, they could be kilogram meter squared per second squared, right? But, but the answer is probably not in that. The answer is in kilojoules. So if this is joules, and uh, let's round uh, three, 532 joules, okay? Now we got to convert to kilojoules to be sure. Because, look, whoever made this test, this uh, review document of a sneak, okay, 5.32 and 5.32, right, with different uh, powers of 10. Right? So you got to get them working. So let's make this into scientific, let's make it into kilojoules. So how many joules in a kilojoule? Well, if you want to be certain and not potentially make a mistake, Cancel your joules 
and convert it to kilojoules. So we need 10 to the third joules in a kilojoule. All right. So what happens to the sign of that 10 if you bring it from the denominator to the numerator? It goes from positive to negative. So this would be 532 times 10 to the minus third. Right? Kilojoules. That's not up there. We need it's they're all in scientific notation, you can see. So 5.32 times 10 to the minus one kilojoule. Now we're there. And that's why the answer is A. <clears throat> okay. Everybody with me, or did I lose somebody dragging you behind the horse on a rope? Okay, let's hope not. <clears throat> that was two. Let's take a look at three. Not, I really took too much time with that one. I can see it coming. I'm going to be back in here after lab. <clears throat> Number three, which of the following statements correctly describes the signs of a Q and W for the following exothermic process? At uh, pressure equals one atmosphere and temperature equals 370K. Oh, and the process is water gas, to water liquid. Okay. And it tells you it's an exothermic process. Right? So we know what the sign of Q is already. What is it? If it's exothermic, the sign on Q is negative. Yeah. Okay. How about um W, right, we got Q, how about W? If you're going from a gas to a liquid, right? Here's your container and there's water gas in here. It's gonna condense in this pool of water liquid. So what's happening to it? The volume is decreasing. And if the pressure is constant, that means as the as the water condenses, it gives off heat. This piston has to drop. All right. If it doesn't, then when that that gas condenses, it's going to leave a vacuum behind, and then the pressure is not one atmosphere anymore. So this piston has to drop. So what do we learn from the lecture? When the piston drops, the surroundings are doing work on the system. Right, which means W is positive. Whoa, oh, I was looking at the wrong one. I'm scared for a second. <laughs> All right, this one's easy. Does everybody understand work? Okay. Why do we even bother with work and heat? Because of internal energy. That's why we're even interested in the work and heat because of its contribution to internal energy. All right, so let me see if I can do this. It must be off screen. It is off screen. We need to get to it. All right, number seven. One mole of an ideal gas is expanded from a volume of one liter to a volume of 8.93 liters against a constant external pressure of one atmosphere. Okay, so the pressure is constant at one atmosphere. 
and the initial volume is one liter. 1.0 of liter. The final volume is 8.93 liters. Okay, so far so good. How much work in joules is performed on the surroundings? First of all, is that what it's doing? It's going from one liter to 8.93 liters. Yeah, expanding gas performs work on its surroundings. So that's true. How much work is performed on the surroundings? Okay, what do we know about the equivalence of work and pressure volume? Remember the formula? Minus D delta D. That's assuming pressure is constant. If pressure is not constant, then it has to come inside that change sign. <clears throat> but this is the one that we, we work out in class. All right, so now all we have to do is plug in the numbers. Um, one atmosphere, I'll put the two zeros that I left off up there. One atmosphere, negative sign. And then how do we calculate a change in volume? It's always final minus initial, correct? So final minus initial. All right. So that'll be 7.93 times one. Liter atmospheres, negative liter atmospheres. Okay, here's the problem. That answer's not up there. The units are in joules. So we got a unit conversion problem. This has to be converted from liter atmospheres to joules. So that means we need a conversion factor. Is it given? Yeah. 101.3. There we go. Now I'm not going to waste time on the calculator. It should be minus 803. And let's see, is that reasonable? Yeah, eight times 100 is about 800. That's reasonable. All right, let's see if I can scroll to the next one. There's 12. Calculate the work associated with the compression of a gas from 121 liters, initial volume, 121.0 liters, final volume. If it's going to be compressed, there's got to be a start and finish, 80.0 liters. Constant pressure, 13.1 atmospheres. Okay, this is the same as before, only now, Notice that when we do the calculation, minus P delta V, we still got that minus out there. And we got a pressure of 13.1 atmospheres. And then final minus initial, 80 minus 121. There. So you can see from this, you're going to have a negative sign right there with this term times the negative. The value should be positive. Does that match what it, the problem says? The work associated with the compression of a gas. It doesn't tell you. So the sign is important. Our sign is going to be positive. And in this case, they're accepting liter atmospheres as work. So it should come out with 537 liter atmospheres. And for that reason, there's also an A with a minus 537. That's in case you put these in the wrong order, then you come out with the wrong answer. Multiple choice questions have their advantages, but they're also to be very sneaky. Just because you find your answer up there doesn't mean it's the right one. 
as whoever creates these questions has it in their mind what possible mistake could be made and then calculate it out okay there's the wrong answer put it in one of the selections okay uh we have to scroll this one looks like we've got several on this one so uh consider a gas in a one liter bulb at the standard temperature and pressure that's connected via a valve to another bulb that's initially evacuated and i know it's scooped over a little bit answer the following concerning what occurs when the valve between the two bulbs is open a one liter bulb connected to another bulb and it doesn't say how, many, how much it is uh, we can, look at it. can i get it no let's do this most of the there then i can scroll and catch the others Okay, so for 14 through 17, we've got a one liter bulb connected with a valve to another bulb. It doesn't matter how big it is. And this is at standard temperature and pressure. Uh, for a gas, that's uh, zero degrees Celsius and one atmosphere. And this is the zero atmospheres. <clears throat> okay, answer these following questions um, when we open the valve. So what's true about Q? This is 14, right? Q is greater than zero, equal to zero, less than zero, more information is needed. What's Q for this system? It's zero, right? All we've done is expand the um, system to include that one, but the amount of heat that's in that system is still there. It hasn't moved. So Q is equal to zero. How about 15? What's true about value of W? Is the gas expanding against the pressure? No, that's evacuated. So there's no force, even though there might be a distance, there's no force. So W has to be zero. Okay, not working against any kind of force. It's like when I'm standing up here pushing against the wall. I'm pushing on it, but it ain't moving. Okay, 16. What's true about delta E? Well, if there's no work, if there's no work done and there's no heat transfer, oops, Q plus W equals zero. Delta E is zero also. How about 17? How about delta H? Delta H is related to, but not exactly the same as what? E. So, if there's no heat that's been transferred, the delta H has to be zero. It can't be anything else but. And 18. Well, let's see, I'm going to scroll that in. Oh, 17. Did I do? Yeah, I did 17. 14, 15, 16, 17. Okay, 18 coming up. So, that's all there is with that. 18 is a separate one. Of energy, work, enthalpy, this, this, and heat. How many are state functions? Do you remember this is just memory? How many of those are state functions? That one and that one. So what does that leave the others? What are they? Starts with a P. 
their path function. That's a path function, that's a path function. Which means it matters how we get from one place to the other with this value that we need. But for the path, the uh, state functions, it doesn't matter where you started, where you end up, whatever's in between is irrelevant. Right, so the answer is two. Only two of these are state functions. Why did I bother tweaking your brain about path functions? Because maybe a question like this will show up on the exam and it won't be state functions. It might be the same thing, but ask you path functions. Yeah. Always keep that in mind. Never trust your instructor. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, 19. Which of the following properties are intensive properties? Remember, intensive. What's the key to an intensive? Amount. Let's do it in broken uh, Native American English. Amount, not matter. I just think of me in a tumbler. <clears throat> so which one of those does the amount not matter? This one? Well, mass matters. Oh yeah, the amount of stuff matters. How about temperature? That's an intensive property. So what's what are the others that I'm kicking out here? They're extensive properties where the amount does matter. Okay, how about volume? The amount does matter. That's not intensive. Concentration. That is intensive. Right? Concentration in your solution. Doesn't matter how much of the solution you got. If you've got a concentration value, it's going to be that no matter how much you pull out of that container. Energy. Energy is not an intensive property because the amount of whatever goes into it determines the energy. There should only be uh, two, Roman numeral two and Roman numeral four. Let's see, 23, gotta scroll again. Let me see. Yeah. I can't get it all over. I'll just go and get it when the time comes. 23. Consider this reaction. Ethanol, that's the drinking kind. You're going to burn it, and it makes carbon dioxide and water. And the enthalpy for this reaction, as written and balanced, is balanced, is minus 1.37 times 10 to the third kilojoules. So it's kilojoules, that many kilojoules per one mole of ethanol, or per three moles of oxygen, two moles of carbon dioxide, or three moles of water. It's for that reaction as balanced. Okay. What are the following propositions? Uh, consider the following propositions. The reaction is endothermic, exothermic, or the enthalpy term would be different if the water form was gas. Which of these, these propositions is true? Okay, we didn't talk much about that last, that Roman numeral three. So we're going to get that one now. All right, first of all, is it, it can't be endothermic and exothermic. So which one is it? Exo, right? it's a negative delta H. So it's exothermic. Right? The enthalpy term would be different if the water form was gaseous. That is true. Because think about it, you have condensed the gas into a liquid. So the temperature here has to be the right uh, value to give you a liquid water. If you're actually measuring the reaction in uh, an alcohol lamp, then everything's gonna be gas and it's gonna have a different temperature because it takes energy, well, actually it gives up energy to go from uh, a gas to a liquid. 
So this is probably going to be a higher value than if this were a gas. It's that condensation factor that's incorporated into this value. So that's why number three is also, uh, let's see, one and three are both true. Oh, excuse me, two and three, exothermic. Okay. All right, 24 is this one. Oh, calorie injury problem. Okay, that's good. We need one of those today. So everybody got your lab notebook set up? Okay. And you understand the calculations? Or are you just going for the data first? And then worry about the calculations later. <laughs> okay. <laughs> How much heat is required to raise the temperature of a 5.75 gram sample of iron? 5.75 grams. This is the mass of iron. Uh, with a specific heat of 0 0.450 joules per degree C gram. Or gram degree C, both work. And we're going from Initial temperature, yeah, 25 degrees C, and final temperature of 79.8 degrees C. So how much heat is required to do that? Is it, are we gonna have to put heat in there to make this happen? Yeah, it's going from a low temperature to a high temperature. So we've got to add energy. All right, what's the formula? Um, heat equals specific heat of the material times the mass times the change in temperature. So we need the specific heat. Here we go. Q equals 0 0.450. I'm going to leave the units out because I'm running out of room. The mass is 5.75 grams, right? Okay, so so far so good. The grams match. Now we need temperature. Final minus initial. 79.8 minus 25.0 degrees C. Degrees C is in the numerator. Degrees C is in the denominator. They cancel. Cancel, cancel, leave us joules. And that's what we're looking for. Energy, heat, joules. So do all that stuff, and you should come out with 142 joules. Okay, and it's going to be a positive value. So that means relative to the sample, which is the system, we're adding heat to the system with the positive value. Okay. All right. Now, when you do these calculations in your sleep, you work enough problems, you can do them in your sleep now, can't you? No? Uh oh. Wishful thinking. Well, there we go, 26. All right. Here's another calorimetry problem. Looks like it's a little more complicated. 32.5 gram piece of aluminum. Maybe I'll read it backwards. Calculate the mass of water in the calorimeter. Okay, remember what the, uh, uh, well, let's see what else we need before I try to write the formula up there. Okay, so we've got water in the calorimeter. We've got a chunk of aluminum and with a given molar heat capacity. That's important because they're giving us grams, but the heat capacity is in moles per mole. Heat it to this temperature and drop it into a calorimeter with water. Water has a specific heat here. This is the specific heat in terms of grams. The water is initially at 22.3 degrees. The final temperature, 24.2. Calculate the mass of water. Okay, the reason I wanted to read through the whole thing first was this problem is ignoring 
the effect of the calorimeter itself. It just says it's basic. You have to ignore it because it's not given. So the calorimeter is is ignored in this problem, which means what stays in what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Everything inside that calorimeter is zero. All right. So the Q of the aluminum plus the Q of water is all we're going to deal with here. When we do this in the lab, we're going to have another term here, the Q of the calorimeter. Right. But in this case, we don't have it. <coughs> all right. So <clears throat> notice that the molar heat capacity is 24.03 joules per degree C mole. And we need, with a mass of 32.5 grams of aluminum, that needs to be converted to moles. Otherwise, our specific heat, our molar heat capacity, won't work. Right? So we need a unit conversion here. Grams, mole, and quotient means molar mass. So I look at aluminum, it's 26.98. 26.98 grams per mole. I will have to calculate this one. <clears throat> Twenty six point ninety eight divided into that is one point two zero four six. One point two zero four six um, joules per gram degree C. Oh, excuse me. You guys want to let me get away with that, weren't you? That's just moles. <laughs> okay, so now we can set up our problem. Zero equals, what is Q? Our value for S for aluminum is 24.03. Joules per uh, mole degree C. And then the moles, 1.2046 of aluminum. And then the temperature change, final minus initial. What's the final temperature of aluminum? Same as the water, 24.2 degree. And its initial temperature was 82.4. You see, okay. Now we're going to add the second term. For water, 4.184, correct? Joules per gram degree C. Then the mass of the water. Do we know the mass of the water? That's the unknown. Mass of the water. Temperature change. Final. Final is the same as the aluminum. But the initial is different. 22.3. 22.3. There we go. So you, that's the thinking part. Your problem is set up with one unknown. You just solve that and then. So is anybody going to have trouble doing that? We did one in class, I think. Multiply that times that times whatever this is, right? And you get a negative number, correct? Right? Yeah, because that was bigger than this one. <clears throat> this one you get a positive number because that was bigger than this one. But you get this times that times this. So whatever that value is times M <clears throat> plus this, which is a negative. And actually, I would leave this on the right-hand side and take all of this and put it on the left-hand side. That changes the, the sign positive. Okay. Do we need to work this out? Huh? No? Okay, good. And then when you, when you solve for this value, Right? Solving the algebraic equation is, is a matter of getting the unknown on one side of the equation, everything else on the other side, right? Then you know what the value is. So if I if you do this right, you should come out with 212 grams. Okay.
All right. 47. Let me see if this one is substantially different than this. 45.9 gram sample of metal is heated and then placed in a calorimeter containing what metal was used. So I'm not going to work this one out. I'm just going to say when you get, when you set this problem up, you're going to have a, a complete, you're going to have a complete value for the water. All the terms are going to be there in numerical form. So it's going to be a value. Over here, you're going to have that for the metal is unknown. And you'll have the mass of the metal and you'll have the delta T. And you solve for the mass of the metal. I'm, uh, excuse me, the uh, specific heat of the metal. And then you take the specific heat of the metal and compare it to one of these values, whichever one's closer. And if there's if it's far enough apart and you you can justify your answer, you can pick none of these. Right. But if I mark it wrong, you're going to have to come to me and show me your work and say, look, are my calculations right? And I'll look at them and say, OK, they're right. And based on your calculations, there's no right answer up there. Or you could pick the best one and save us all a lot of grief. <laughs> now, I won't hear anybody's arguments as long as you've got the facts to back you up. Let's go to it. Okay, 28. You take 295.5 gram of a solid at 30 degrees and let it melt in 425 grams of water. The water temperature decreases from 85.1 to 330. Calculate the heat of fusion of this solid. Okay, we didn't talk about heat of fusion. Heat of fusion is the um, amount of heat. It's, it's an intensive property. The amount of heat per unit of a solid that it's required to melt it. Like think of ice, say an ice cube. How much heat does it is required to melt that cube of ice, make liquid water out of it? A certain amount of heat has to go in. Maybe I better reset this one up. Um, 295.5 grams of a solid. So we have the mass of the solid is equal to 295.5 grams, okay? And this solid is at 30 degrees. So the initial temperature of that solid is 30 degrees. Yep, 30 degrees, okay? And The final temperature is still 30 degrees. That's required. If you're going to do the heat of fusion of any solid that goes to a liquid, it happens at a specific temperature and stays there. What amount of heat does it take to go from solid to liquid at that temperature? So, so the initial and the final temperature here are going to be the same. But um, water, the mass of the water is 425 grams, okay, and the water temperature initial is 85.1 degrees C, but its final temperature is 30 degrees, okay, same as this one. Okay, <clears throat> so here's what's going on. You can still set it up like our Vegas problem. So the heat of fusion of that solid plus the heat change of water must be zero. We can calculate this one because we know um, mass. Well, let's let's put uh, specific heat of water first. Ah. There we go. Um, joules per gram degree C, and then the mass of the water is 425, 
and then the temperature change is it's going from 85 to 30. So it's going, there's the final minus the initial. There we go. On this side, you have a slightly different formula that fits into this one. All you need here is the uh, heat of fusion. And let's see, I'm trying to think of the, the symbols that they use for the heat of fusion. Oh, I think it's a delta H. Delta H fusion. Okay. And this is going to be in joules per gram. And over here, you have um, the mass, right? You need the mass 295.5 to cancel the grams and leave you with joules. Okay. So now we have a, uh, a formula, uh, an equation in one unknown. So let's let's do that uh, water part first, and it's going to come out negative, right? Thirty minus eighty-five point one times four twenty-five times four point one eight four. So this one <coughs> is this part over here. Is minus 9.798 times 10 to the fourth what? Joules. And this one is still 295.5 delta H. Okay, so move this one on this side and divide it by that, and that'll give you delta H. So I've already got that in there. And when we move this one over here, it changes the sign, it's going to be positive, right? And that's what you would expect. The value is going to be positive because, in order to change that from a solid to a liquid, you have to add energy to it. It's a positive Q going into that solid, the system, to make it liquid. So, we're going to take this one and divide by that. And I get the delta H of fusion equals three, three, yeah, I'm tempted to go three, three, two, three, three, one point six joules per gram. Okay, so they rounded it off. They rounded something else off in here too. Because rounded off in my figures to be 332. Cannot solve without the heat capacity of the solid. Okay, so that's not a valid answer. Pick the best answer. If you get this answer, pick 331. Because you don't have none of these as an option. Everybody see what I did? Okay, good. Real question is, can you do it? So it goes back to the problem solving technique. What's the question? <clears throat> What's the question? <coughs> Devise a strategy. Do you have all the information you need? Work the problem. Uh, 28, let's see. Or is that the one we were doing? That's the one we were doing. Okay. Good morning, my healing. All right. All right. Well, I'm not going to hurry. I'll just come back and finish it as usual. Thirty-two. In the lab, you mix two solutions, each originally at the same temperature, and the temperature of the resulting solution decreases. Okay, which is the following, which is the following is true. The chemical reaction is releasing energy. Does that make any sense? The temperature decreases, it has to be absorbing energy. The energy released is equal to SN delta T. Hmm. 
you can't tell. There's not enough information there to tell that. Right? That would be cute if we knew the specific heat of something. Now, this is a heat problem. This is a calorimetry problem. Right? It's it's like one that you're going to have. Right? You're going to add two solutions together. In fact, the first experiment is acid-base reaction. Right? You're going to add two solutions together, and what do you expect to happen? Temperature go up and down or down. Up, up. Acid-base reactions are endothermic. Okay, so that's not it. How about uh, chemical reaction is absorbing energy? There you go. If the temperature decreases, the reaction has to absorb energy. It's definitely not exothermic. And it's not more than one of these either. So that's why the answer is C. All righty. Scroll time. And I got the got the scroll bar back on the screen, or is it's off? It's off to the right. Yeah, it's over there. Never mind. Thirty six. Exactly one hundred and twenty three point seven joules will raise the temperature of ten grams of metal from twenty five to sixty. What's the specific heat? All right. You can do this one. All you need is uh, what is the energy that's put into the system? There's the specific heat. There's the mass. We're given mass, 10 grams, and delta T. Right? It goes from 25 to 60. So final 60, it goes uh, what, 35 degrees. 35 degrees times 10 grams is 350. So S will be. 123.7 divided by 350. We can do that. 127, 123.7. What did I say? Divided by 350. 35.3? No. I got my. Oh, yeah, 0.353. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, change in temperature is final uh, 60 minus 25. Right? That's 35, correct? Yeah. Okay. Mass is 10 grams, so that's 350. And then this is 123.7. So 350 and 120 will give you the specific. I did go too fast on that one. Do I see how I got that? 60. Yeah, fine. it went from 25 to 60. This is final minus initial, which is 35. This is that many grams. And all the time I'm checking my units. Right? Units, grams, okay, grams are good. Degree C, they're good. Joules are good. So I didn't have to do any unit conversions. I just had to use the formula. You put everything in the right place. Thirty-eight. Let's scroll over here. On a cold winter day, we're not there yet. We're getting there. A steel metal fence post feels colder than a wooden fence post of identical size because okay, so steel versus wood. And the steel metal fence post feels colder. This one feels colder than wood. Because what? The specific heat capacity of steel is higher than the, than the heat capacity of wood. Okay, think of it this way. <clears throat> this is your pipe. And this is also the system. 
or should your hand be assisted? No, we need to we need to make it a draw a conclusion about the system. So let's keep it the system. The pipe is the system. And your hand. So should I do a cartoon or a real? There we go. <clears throat> so your hand is the ceramics. Okay. Pipe or the wood. Wood or pipe. Okay. If your hand feels colder, what's going to happen when you touch that thing? Heat's going to go this way, right? Right? So heat's a positive value. So much heat is going to go in there like that. And when is it going to stop? When it reaches the same temperature as your hand, or at least locally, anyway. Okay, so uh, the heat flows out of your hand into the pipe. When is it going to stop? When it flows, when it feels cold, that means your hand is getting colder. Right. So, if the pipe has a certain, uh, if, if the steel. Has a certain heat capacity, and the wood has a certain heat capacity. Maybe I'll we'll draw up the whole thing. Q of the steel equals uh, S for the steel uh, times the mass uh, times the change in temperature versus. Q of wood, I better write that out. Wood has a heat capacity and a certain mass and a change in temperature. Now we're going to have to hold um, a couple of terms constant. If we don't, then we can't solve for this one for this one. So the mass, the mass has to be constant for both of them. So the same mass of wood, the same mass of pipe. Okay. So those are going to be constant. How about the change in temperature? Well, the change in temperature does vary, right? The change in temperature has to be greater for the pipe, right? So this steel has to be greater than the uh, wood. wood. And if you're going to measure the same amount of heat moving, and these are both the same, then as the change in temperature goes up, S has to go down. So if the change in temperature means that your hand is going to feel colder, this change in temperature is greater than that change in temperature. If this is greater than that, then this has to be less than that. Does that make any sense? I didn't see any other way to explain it. I, mean, I tried thinking of um, like a thought problem uh, without numbers or anything like that, without equations, but it didn't seem to work. But this works. If this is constant, that's constant, then these have to vary opposite one another. And if this one feels colder than that one, that means this is bigger, that's less, that means this is. This is less and that's bigger. Okay, that's the way I reasoned it. I don't remember how I did it in the work problems. Did I do it in the work problems? 38. Let me see. Yeah. Oh, I did it the same way. <laughs> Surprise, surprise. And I did those work problems, God, it must be at least eight years ago. So I'm still seeing the problems the same way. Okay. Consider this reaction, the same one we've seen before. When 21.1 grams of ethyl alcohol is burned, how much energy is released as heat? All right. 
stoichiometry problem. This time, stoichiometry with heat. Right? So what do you do? Well, first you say, is the problem balanced? I mean, is the equation balanced? Yeah. Equation is balanced. C2H5OH. Three oxygens, two CO2s, and three waters. And the delta H is negative 1.37 times 10 to the third kilojoules. Okay. Now we're given 21.1 grams of ethyl alcohol. How much energy? Well, we want to know how much energy comes out of that reaction. Okay. Um, this is that many kilojoules per mole. Uh, now I'm going to use my abbreviation. ETOH is ethanol. Anytime you use an abbreviation, put an OH on the end of it, you're saying it's an alcohol. So this is ethanol. The same as this one. <clears throat> okay. So if it's that many kilojoules per mole, then we need to know how many moles of this is being processed. 21.1 grams. And they gave it to us, didn't it? 46.07. Grams per mole. Okay. I guess I need to do that. Twenty-one point one should be about a half, actually less than a half. Point four five eight. Okay. So now it's unit conversion. We're going to take this and convert it to kilojoules. Right? Moles of what? Ethanol. So if we put this one out here, minus 1.37 times 10 to the third kilojoules per mole of ethanol, then all we have to do is right, multiply that times that. Now I get minus 6.27 times 10 to the second kilojoules. C. Okay. Are you guys calculating the same time I am? Make sure I do it right. I've been known to work through problems the wrong way, all the way to the end. What I'm saying. I eventually catch myself, but I mean, it's a waste of time, time right? <clears throat> Unless you just enjoy watching your instructor make mistakes. <clears throat> Total volume of hydrogen gas needed to fill the Hindenburg. You guys, I don't even remember the Hindenburg. I wasn't alive then. But we do have some engineering drawings. We know how much gas it holds or held before it caught fire. Okay, its volume is equal to 2.11 times 10 to the eighth liters. That's a lot of gas at one atmosphere. Okay, and 24.7 degrees C. How much energy was evolved when it burned? Okay, based on this equation, hydrogen plus oxygen yields water. So hydrogen plus a half an oxygen yields water. This is liquid. Delta H equals minus 286 kilojoules. Okay, why do we write it that way? Well, if we write it this way, then for every mole of hydrogen, 
That's the energy. So all we need to do is find out how many moles of gas does that represent, right? Think back to chapter five. Right? Imagine yourself in chapter five. <clears throat> With the gas equation, the ideal gas equation. We want to know moles. Right? So pressure is one atmosphere. Volume is 2.11 times 10 to the eighth liters. That's the correct unit. Uh, this is atmospheres, it's the correct unit. On the bottom are 0 0.08206 liter atmospheres per mole K and temperature 24.7. Did I do that? Has to be K here. Plus, what's the conversion factor? Add what to it? Brain spin or otherwise pop it out. Two seven to three. There we go. That gives us the number of moles. Two point one one ten to the eighth. Okay. Point oh eight two oh six divided into that. And then 24.7 plus 273 is 297.7. And we also divide that into. All right, so I get number of moles 8.64 times 10 to the sixth moles of hydrogen. Okay, now we want to convert that to kilojoules. There's our factor. Minus two a six kilojoules per mole. So minus two a six times that, and I get. Let's see, it's in scientific notation in kilojoules. So all I have to do is say minus two forty seven times ten to the two point four seven. Two point four seven. Yeah, that was 10 to the ninth kilojoules. And that's the heat. D. Okay. You know, time. Okay. Maybe time for one more problem. Did I have the, uh, for the lab, did I have uh, like a discussion demo video in Brightspace? Okay, so you got a chance to take a look at it. Do we need to talk about it some more or did it fill in all the gaps? Don't remember. <laughs> well, bring up some questions then, as soon as we get finished with this. Uh, let's see. Based on the above reaction, what energy change occurs at 1.2 moles of methane? I think you can do that. In fact, that was easier than any of the ones we've done so far. Release or absorb. So once you get the number, be sure to keep the sign. And that'll tell you whether it's released or absorbed because you have different selections, right? This one released or absorbed, this one released or absorbed, and just this one released. Uh, it's a unit conversion, 1.2 moles of methane, right? And there's only one methane. So this is that much kilojoules per mole of methane. That's how you cancel the, that unit out. Okay, we're good. I don't have to dwell on this one. Okay. Um, I'm gonna deal with this one. 
if the same amount of heat is added to 25 grams of each of the metals, which which are all at the same initial temperature, which metal will have the highest temperature? Okay. We can dispense with this one pretty quick. Um, when we're looking at um, it, this is the formula um, S M delta T. So the same amount of heat. So this is the same for each one. That's constant. Is added to twenty five grams of each one. That's constant. And they're at the same initial temperature. So this one is going to have uh, TF is going to vary minus TI, which is constant. So this is the variable, and that's a variable. So really, this one is going to be um, oh, I got a backwards stone. Nobody said anything. There you go. So this is going to be higher than that for heating the metal. All right. So it's going to be a positive value. Um, which metal will have the highest temperature with the same amount of heat? Okay. That's constant. That's constant. So we look at this, right? They're on the same side of the equation. So if one goes up, the other has to go down. So which will have the highest temperature? The one with the lowest specific heat. Right. If this is going up, that has to come down. The lowest specific heat will answer that question, which is this one, lead, right? <coughs> Ooh, I got four minutes to go. Let's see, there's a lot of repetition in here. We haven't done Hess's law yet. All right, let's take a look at number 59A. Given the heats of the following reactions, these several reactions are here because we're going to use them to calculate the value of enthalpy, delta H, for this target equation right here. Okay. So, the way you use Hess's law is you start with the target equation. So we're headed for this one, and it's it's going to be hard for me to uh, to stay in this small space with all that information. But what I may do is temporarily swing this around like that. Give me a little more room over here on the board. All right. Well, this 59 should go over to there. And yeah, that's a lot better. Yeah. So our target equation, and now you can't see a lot of it, but I think you can still see the target equation. P4O10. P4O10 plus 6 PCL5, PCL5 yields. And for now, um, P4O10 10 is a solid and everything else is a gas. And then 10 Cl3PO. All right, what do we have to choose from? Well, we've got um, the first one is P4, 6Cl2, P4 plus 6Cl2 yields 4PHCl3, 4PHCl3, right? Can we use this one, right? The value here is minus, uh, 1225.6 minus 1225.6. These are all the delta H's. Challenge you <clears throat> Okay, 
So how would this one fit in here? Does this one have anything that we can use there? PCL3, nope. CL2, nope. P4, nope. Okay. That doesn't mean we can't use it later, but we're going to have to go to something that's actually in the equation. So how about the second one? All right, this one is P4 plus 502 equals P4 <clears throat> 010. Okay, notice, well, let me put this up here, minus 2967.3. 2967.3. Notice that this is part of that equation. And that's it. That's the only thing in that equation. But it needs to be on the other side. So what we have to do is put this over here. Okay. And notice also that there's one mole here, one mole there. So we'll, all we have to do is flip it. And that changes this to a positive 2967.3. Okay, so this is gonna be one of the equations that go together to make that the way it is now. Right. And we'll mark this one off too. Okay, so we got uh, P4010 taken care of. How about three? Three has PCL3, CL2 and PCL5. Three has PCL5. Right. PCL3 plus CL2 yields PCL5, correct? Minus 84.2 kilojoules. Okay. This one also needs to be on that side. But we need six of them. So we're going to have to flip it and multiply it by six. Right. So we need to go like this plus this. Six times that plus flip it. So now we have six PCL5 yields six PCL3 plus six CL2. And not only do we have to flip this one and make it a positive, now we have to multiply it by the factor of six. So now I need my calculator. 84.2 times six is 505.2 kilojoules. And that's going to be another that goes in this one and that one so far go into this one. Now we've taken care of this one, P410 and PCL3, uh, PCL5, here we go, PCL5, CL5. What's next? Well, let's see, Roman numeral four has PCL3, it has CL3PO in it. All right, so that's PCL3. plus one half O2 yields CL3PO. And that's negative 285.7 kilojoules. Okay, this is on the correct side, but we need 10 of them. So we're gonna have to multiply this one by 10. Okay, 10P, CL3 plus 10 times a half is five. And then 10 CL3PO. So now we got that from here. But this has to be multiplied by 10 also. But we don't have to change the sign because we didn't flip the equation. 2857. So we're going to use this one this one and this one. Okay, notice that what we've done is introduced 
terms that are not in that equation. Okay. This one's not in that equation. This one's not in that equation. PCL5, yes. PCL3, no, that's not in that equation. CL2, that's not in that equation. We're going to use this one. P4, uh, let's see, I didn't mark that. P4010 is there. P4, P4 is not up there. O2, O2 is not up there. Okay. So we've got these checked off that we have up there. What are we going to do with these others? Well, let's, let's look at the, let's compare each one of these. Um, oh, I forgot this one, this first one. We didn't have anything in that one up there. So we don't have this one. We don't have this one, and we don't have that one. But will it cancel any of these others? Well, let's see. There's a P4, and there's a P4. This is on the left-hand side. This is on the right-hand side. And there are no other P4s in there, right? Okay, so that one cancels. That's good. How about chlorine? Uh, chlorine. Here's a chlorine, don't find it anywhere else but there. This is on the right, that's on the left. That one cancels. Okay, about oxygen. There's five oxygen here, and five oxygen here. On the left, five oxygen, on the right, five oxygen. Okay, what do we got left? Well, it looks like the only things we have left in the boxes are PCL3. PCL3 on the right is six here and four there. That's 10 PCL3s. And on the left, 10 PCL3s. So that cancels both of these. Okay. Now we can use this one because we didn't change this in any way. But we are going to have to add it together because it was part of the um, I'm going to ask on blank. Uh, one of the equations that we added together, so we have to add the enthalpies as well. So we're going to add this one, this one, this one. And that one. Well, let's see what we get. Start off. One, two, two, five point six, negative. Positive two, nine, six, seven point three. Positive five, oh, five point two. And negative two, eight, five, seven. Okay. And let's see, we should get negative six one zero point one kilojoules. And there it is. Right there. Now that was a lot of work, I know. That's why you have to be very methodical about your procedure. Number 59. All right. Now, let me swing this back around. So you can see the whole. There we go. And I'll only tilt it if I need it. Next one. All right. 
Here's another S's law. Choose the correct equation for the standard enthalpy of formation for CO, carbon monoxide gas, where delta HF0 for CO equals minus uh, 110.5 kilojoules per mole. Okay, they make a note here, GR stands for graphite. Okay, so they, we want to know the correct formula and the enthalpy number for the heat of formation of CO. So how do we write the heat of formation of CO? I think I can stay on this side of the board now. 68. You start with the product, CO gas. And over here, you have the elements in their most stable form of two. This is going to be a gas. This is going to be at, at room temperature and one atmosphere pressure. This will be graphite. All right. Now we balance the equation with coefficients on this side only. This side is always one mole. So we only need one oxygen. So a half of an O2 gives us one oxygen and then one carbon, right? So what's the value? Well, <clears throat> if the delta H as given is negative 110.5 kilojoules per mole, then that will be the value, right? So we look for the one that matches this one. It looks like C will do the job with this value for the standard enthalpy of formation, 68. I'm ready. Let's see, Let me move this back over. Um, scroll time. Let's see if I can do it from here. Yeah, seventy-eight. One of the main advantages of hydrogen as a fuel is what? A says. The only product of hydrogen combustion is water. Well, is that true? Well, hydrogen, like that, when you combust something, you're combining it with oxygen. That's the definition of combustion. Right? So what are you gonna get when you put those two together? Water. Right. So you need two of these and two of those. So A is true. Is that the main advantage of hydrogen as a fuel? Well, according to the greenies, yeah, because there's no CO2. No carbon dioxide produced out of that. No carbon compounds whatsoever. It exists as a free gas. That's no advantage. Lots of fuels exist as a gas, like methane. It can be economically supplied by the world's oceans. Main advantage. Well, yeah, that's possible. How do you get it from the oceans? Well, you take water and you run electricity through it, like right? put energy in, and you get hydrogen plus oxygen. It's just the reverse reaction. Is that the main advantage? The main advantage as a fuel is the fact that it produces only water. This is an advantage, but not the main advantage because you can get water from anywhere. You can purify it from seawater, from fresh water, um, or you can, you can manufacture it. 
Um, plants can economically produce hydrogen needed. No, plants don't do that. Microorganisms, some microorganisms do, but it's not economical. Contains a large amount of energy per unit volume of hydrogen gas. Um, that's not the main advantage as a fuel. Uh, it, it does produce a certain amount of energy per unit volume, <clears throat> but there are other gases that produce much more energy per unit volume. This is the main advantage. Hydrogen combustion produces water. All right, 79. Which of the following is not being considered as an energy source for the future? not being considered an energy source. Remember that slide where we had all the possible energy sources that were either in use now or uh, future, right? Ethanol was one, right? We've got that in our gas, mixed in our gas now. Uh, methanol is a possibility. Seed oil is a possibility, yeah. Shale oil, uh, we would be producing shale oil by the millions of barrels a day if it weren't for the Biden administration and their insane policy. The only one that can't be an energy source is carbon dioxide. You cannot burn carbon dioxide. It is an end product. Now we haven't got to the point where we can say why it is, but it is an end product of, of many types of combustion. So E, carbon is not being considered as an energy source. All right, we'll skip a few of these. And let's see. Okay, 90. A gas absorbs 188 joules of heat. Our system here as a gas, and it absorbs uh, 188 joules of heat. So Q in this case is positive, right? And then it performs 310 joules of work. So now it's doing work on the surroundings. That means it's a negative 310 joules. The change in internal energy. So remember our formula change in internal energy equals work plus heat. So minus 310 plus 188 uh, should be a negative value. So let's see, that's two, three, one, right? Negative 132. Uh, no. 122. 8 to 10, 8 to 10. That's right, 22. Negative 122 joules. There it is right there. Doesn't help us draw a picture. Okay, let's see. Where's another one I picked out? Oops, I'm gonna have to scroll. Let's see. I think I can still read that. Number 99. Nitric acid was first prepared 1200 years ago by heating naturally occurring sodium nitrate, saltpeter, with sulfuric acid to produce sodium bisulfate and collecting the vapors of HNO3 produced. Cal calculate the delta H for this reaction. So there you have saltpeter, sodium nitrate, sulfuric acid produces sodium bisulfate plus nitric acid. Um, this is another Hess's law. All of this is fluff. 
All you really need to know is this equation and be sure it's balanced. We'll, we'll check it to be sure it's balanced. And then um, how do you calculate the delta H for that reaction? Well, we're not given separate reactions to use Hess's law. I may I mentioned Hess's law, but it's really not. In this case, well, it's sort of a derivative of Hess's law. We're going to use the individual heats of formation for each of these compounds. Okay, so we need a balanced equation first. Let's see, sodium. Let's see, this is number ninety-nine. Sodium nitrate. And we're not going to need the phases because they're all accounted for up here. Sodium nitrate plus sulfuric acid yields sodium bisulfate plus nitric acid. Okay. Um, Bisulfate is an old, is an archaic name, and what we call trivial name. This is sodium hydrogen sulfate. If you try to look it up nowadays. Okay, let's see. Is that balanced? You got one sodium, one sodium, one nitrate, one nitrate, two hydrogens, one, two, and one sulfate. That equation is balanced. Okay, so what is the formula that we use? We do the heats of formation of each of the products, add them together, and subtract the heats of formation of the reactants. And each time we input a heat of reaction, a heat of formation, we have to use the multiplier of the coefficient. Each one of these is a coefficient of one. So we just take the numbers straight off the chart and we say sodium bisulfate. Minus one one two five point five. Okay. Nitric acid minus one thirty five point one. And these are kilojoules. Kilojoules per mole. But well, we've got one mole of each, so that's it. Now we're going to subtract sodium nitrate which is minus 467.8. Notice that I put a negative out here because it is a reactant and the reactants get a negative sign. So a negative on a negative makes that positive. And then we're also gonna subtract sulfuric acid, which is minus 814.0. There you go. So do the math. That's a positive, that's a positive, negative, negative. Add them all together. And you should end up with, oh, I missed that. C. You should end up with 21.2 kilojoules. Positive. That means that this reaction is endothermic. It absorbs heat. All right, 99. Oh, that's it. And yeah, that's all I had for uh, this review. Now, one last word of caution. Be sure you know how to work these problems. Don't just memorize the answers. Because if I use any of these in the exam, it's very likely that I will change conditions. It won't change it so much that you'll need a different approach, but if you know the approach, then you can use the values that I do give you to find the right answer. Just a word of warning.